Welcome back, folks. Today we will be talking about the citric acid cycle, or TCA. A lot of learning outcomes for today, folks. But you'll notice the videos are kind of divided in two parts. In the first part, we'll walk ourselves through all the steps of the TCA, but just like glycolysis, know that we are focusing on regulation, okay? So we'll learn some stuff along the way. The main focus is regulation. We'll know that the citric acid cycle is amphibolic. This will be a new word for us. We'll talk about pyruvate dehydrogenase and how it works, and we'll see a bunch of cofactors that it uses. We will learn about the TCA, but hopefully we'll just learn about it and be able to look at a lot of similarities to understand how it works. Then we'll jump into regulation, okay? We'll talk about regulation of both pyruvate dehydrogenase and the various steps of the TCA. Please note that for this material as well, there is a handout in the handouts folder that you will likely find helpful. Our meet a scientist moment of the day is Hans Krebs, that the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle or TCA is named after. He studied under Otto Warburg that we learned about either last time or the time before last when we were together. And he was a very well-respected scientist in Germany. However, he was forced to resign and moved to Britain to do his work because he is of Jewish ancestry when the Nazi party came to power and it was no longer safe for him to live in Germany. So let's get a quick introduction to the citric acid cycle before jumping into it. So here, we are oxidizing carbon-based starting materials, we'll see what that is, into CO2 in eight total steps. Along the way, we'll make three NADH, one FADH2, and one molecule of GTP per pyruvate molecule. We'll end up with a bunch of electrons and protons to make ATP with later. So again, we'll think forward to understanding why redox molecules are high energy. And know that all of this is happening in the mitochondrial matrix. The TCA, we're gonna learn about it right now in terms of how it's connected to oxidative metabolism. But know that it's involved in so much more. It's super important for anabolism as well. The citric acid cycle, zoom in here, shows us how it's kind of a hub of metabolism. It is a major source of the building blocks used for the biosynthesis of a variety of molecules, fatty acids, cholesterol, amino acids, um, let's see, porphyrin rings, for example, right? We branch off into building a lot of different types of molecules through TCA intermediates. And because it is used in both catabolism and anabolism, we call it amphibolic. It does both, catabolism, anabolism. Some general details about the TCA folks is we call it the citric acid cycle, the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or TCA, or Krebs cycle. All of these are kind of interchangeable. You'll probably hear me call it TCA most often because that is short and sweet. It is the hub of cellular metabolism as we just learned. It is also itself a multi-step catalyst because in the first step we'll use oxaloacetate and in the last step we'll make oxaloacetate. This is not incredibly important, but the carbons that initially come into the TCA are not the two that initially leave as CO2. It's only in a couple of cycles that we really work our way through all those carbons and release them as CO2. And what you'll see, folks, is into the citric acid cycle, we'll use three NAD, one FAD, one GDP, and acetyl-CoA to make NADH. FADH2 and a GTP. Before we jump into the TCA itself, 
There is kind of one step in between glycolysis and the TCA that I just kind of call the pre-TCA, even though we'll think about it kind of being as more a part of the TCA. And this step is performed by pyruvate dehydrogenase, or PDH. You'll see that I abbreviate it on the next slide. This enzyme is a complex, it has quaternary structure. It is a massive enzyme complex made by three different enzymes named E1, E2, and E3. Of course, they all have their own names that are more specific. E1 is actually called pyruvate dehydrogenase, that the enzyme complex is named after. E2 is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase, and E3 is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. If you want to take a look at this massive enzyme complex, go ahead and click on the link that you'll get if you downloaded the slides. It's pretty cool to like take a look around. Now the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, in addition to having three different enzymes that comprise its quaternary structure, uses so many coenzymes or cofactors. Here we're calling a lot of them coenzymes because many are strongly uh, linked or covalently attached to their enzyme. We will see how each of these is used over the next few slides. The first one we'll talk about is TPP. That's going to be new for us, but we'll also be introduced to lipoic acid. We'll see CoA for the first time. We'll see an FAD and an NAD. So step one of the PDH complex is performed by the enzyme E1. And so it uses the cofactor TPP, thymine pyrophosphate, to help this mechanism. This enzyme performs a decarboxylation. And what I want you to get from this slide is how TPP is helping with the decarboxylation. So TPP performs a nucleophilic attack on our favorite electrophile. And it allows the elimination of CO2 from the structure and it supports the elimination of CO2 by increasing the resonance stability of the intermediate. And this is something that we've seen before. And I want us to kind of be understanding broad themes here, not specifics. So this helps catalyze the reaction because this molecule can perform resonance right and it increases the resonance stability of the reactive intermediate. That was step one, losing CO2. In step two, we have enzyme E2 grab the carbons from E1, okay? So in, that's oh, too bad that my picture is in the way here. So in this reaction, right, we have pyruvate, we lose the CO2, and we end up with what I like to call kind of the pre-acetyl group, right? This isn't an acetyl yet, it's a hydroxyl. Enzyme 2 is going to grab that pre-acetyl group and it's going to oxidize them, okay? So the enzyme E2 has this cofactor, lipoamide, that has this long flexible chain. This long flexible chain can reach over into the active site E1 and it grabs the pre-acetyl group. Now, this molecule also has this bond here, this disulfide bond, that can perform a redox reaction. 
So in addition to grabbing the preacetyl, it oxidizes it to the full acetyl group. Finally, E2's substrate is CoA. So in comes CoA, and finally it grabs that acetyl group from the ligoamide arm. So what we're seeing is E2 grabs the preacetyl from E1, oxidizes it, and then hands it off to CoA. Finally, enzyme E3 needs to regenerate our catalyst. So in the process of doing its thing, E2, the disulfide bond here, becomes reduced. If we want to use this enzyme as a catalyst, we better oxidize E2 so it can continue to perform a reaction. So enzyme E3's job is to help regenerate E2. It has a flavin. Its flavin, its FADH2, is used to regenerate the lipoamide. But in the course of doing that, E3 itself becomes reduced. So E3 also uses an NAD plus to regenerate its own flavin, so it can continue being a catalyst to regenerate E2. And so here's a slide that kind of shows that happening in a way that's a bit more visual for us all to see. So there is a flavin molecule that is being used in the reaction as well as the NAD here. When the flavin becomes reduced, we need to oxidize it so that E3 can continue on as a catalyst, and we can oxidize the flavin by reducing an NAD. I think this is a pretty interesting binding site, folks, because we have so much happening, right? We have the flavin, the FADH2 molecule. We have the NADH molecule all in the same active site. In addition to this, we have this tyrosine in the active site that kind of can swing in and out. Um, I think this active site is interesting because this moving tyrosine protects the redox reaction here. So it prevents water from entering the active site so that rather than water becoming oxidized or reduced, we actually have these cofactors becoming oxidized and reduced. So to summarize, folks, what did we just see? We saw pyruvate coming in to E1. What E1 does is it helps decarboxylate pyruvate by using TPP, which stabilizes the reactive intermediate. So now we've gone from pyruvate to this pre-acetyl group. E2 comes in and grabs that pre-acetyl group and oxidize it to the acetyl. E2 then hands the acetyl group off to CoA, forming acetyl-CoA from pyruvate. But at this point, folks, right, E2 has been reduced. So how do we regenerate E2? By using E3, which itself becomes reduced, and we can regenerate this enzyme, which is reduced, by using an NAD. That is that pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Up next, let's jump in to the citric acid cycle, and then end by discussing regulation.